Okay, um, welcome everyone to today's talk uh, by Ben Wisner on the topic of something to hide, new technology, dragnet surveillance, and the future of privacy. Uh, my name is Jane Huckabee, and I'm the director of the new International Human Rights Clinic um, here at the Law School, and I'm really thrilled to have Ben here um, today to talk about this topic with us. Um, it would be very difficult to think of anyone other than Ben um, who is better placed to give this presentation and to really move us forward um, toward a framework for better, um, smarter thinking about how to ensure that democratic controls really keep pace with um, developments in technology. Uh, ben is the inaugural director of the ACLU Speech, Privacy and Technology Project, um, which is dedicated to protecting and expanding First Amendment freedoms, to expanding the right to privacy and increasing the control that individuals have over their personal information, and ensuring that civil liberties are enhanced rather than compromised by new advances in science and technology. So, you know, quite a few things that are being done um, in this new project um, at the ACLU. Um, ben has been in the position of directing this project um, since March 2012. Uh, prior to which he litigated numerous um, post-9-11 cases at the ACLU, including challenges to rendition um, and, and torture and, and secret detention and, and so forth. Um, he has appeared regularly in the media, um, testified before Congress, and travelled several times to Guantanamo to monitor military commission proceedings there. Um, it's in those capacities that I first got to know Ben's really exemplary and groundbreaking work, and it is a privilege to have him here today. I'm looking forward to hearing um, his presentation and to the Q&A that follows. So thank you and welcome, Ben. Thanks, Jane. Thanks so much, Jane, for that nice introduction. What, what Jane left out is that we actually litigated some of those cases together. So it's, uh, it's a great privilege for me to be able to come here and, and visit Jane um, in her new digs. Uh, thanks to... <laughs> To all of you for turning out, I will go back and tell my colleagues that if you come and speak here, people arrive on time, and they make a really awesome event poster that you can take home with you. Um, so even before uh, Edward Snowden pulled back the curtain on the nature and scope of the surveillance state uh, and, and revealed to Americans and to the world that the NSA was attempting to collect as many communications as possible and to store them forever. Uh, even before those revelations, uh, we could see already that new technologies were fundamentally altering our lives. Uh, it wasn't so long ago that most of us could live lives of practical obscurity. Uh, most of our activities were unobserved and unrecorded, uh, except by those who were immediately around us. Uh, and consider some of the technologies that we use every day. Um, think about the telephone, um, which in your parents' day used to be connected to a wall with a cord. Uh, you would either speak from home or you might even go into a phone booth and, and, and put in a coin, and there was a door that actually closed. Um, you know, a few months ago, the New York Times uh, wrote an article in which they said we should stop calling our phones phones. We should use a different name, Tracker. Um, that thing in your pocket is constantly connecting to towers. It's broadcasting your precise location because that's the only way that you're able to get service. Some of them have satellite GPS. Uh, and, and think about what your location reveals about you, particularly over time. Uh, one federal court put it like this. Uh, your location data can reveal whether you're a weekly churchgoer, a heavy drinker, a regular at the gym, an unfaithful husband, an outpatient receiving medical treatment, an associate of particular individuals or political groups, and not just one such fact about you, but all such facts. This is data that never existed before, uh, and it is of great interest to your government and to others. Uh, the New York Times reported recently that there were well over a million requests by police to cell phone companies in a year uh, for just location data. Uh, that phone is also a little computer. It's not just broadcasting your location. It's also storing the most intimate details of your lives. 
Uh, it has your text messages. It has your emails. It has your photos. It might connect to your health records. It has all kinds of sensitive information. Let's think about mail. Uh, not so long ago, people actually wrote letters, put them in envelopes, licked them, and put a stamp on it and put it in the mail. Uh, very few of us do that anymore. Uh, it's been a long time that I've since I've done that for, for really any kind of private communication. Uh, we now, of course, use electronic mail, which is never deleted. Uh, you can ask Professor Petraeus of the City University of New York to confirm that. Uh, it is instead stored in a digital cloud. Uh, and most importantly for this conversation, uh, it enjoys different legal protection than that traditional letter that you used to put in an envelope uh, and mail, and we'll come back to that issue. Uh, think about something as basic as newspapers. Um, people used to either just have them delivered to their door, some still do, I do, uh, or even put a quarter in a machine and then read the newspaper. Most of you probably read newspapers online. You should know that your newspaper reading is being tracked by hundreds of companies that are trying to link every one of your clicks to your identity so that they can serve you more targeted advertisement. We can go down the list. Um, shopping, you know, wandering through a bookstore or a record store. Uh, if you do this online, there are companies that are recording every page and every item that you click on. Not just the ones that you buy, but the ones that you look at and for how long and creating very valuable profiles. I think it's fair to say that if somebody followed you around all day uh, as you went into bookstores, record stores, and to your appointments, uh, as you shop for books, clothes, DVDs, medicines, contraceptives, taking notes with a clipboard behind you, you would probably call security or the police. Uh, but we accept the internet equivalent without even paying any kind of attention. Um, we could really, really go on and on through other technologies, photographs that we used to have developed at a store, and now there's billions of photos being uploaded every month to Facebook, which is using facial recognition software to, to uh, ever more sophisticated degrees. Um, but rather than go down that list, uh, I want to make another very important point about this, um, which is that in the past, this kind of data could not have been stored. It certainly couldn't have been stored forever uh, because storage was very, very expensive. Uh, if we look back just about 30 years ago, the cost of hard drive storage per gigabyte was about $100,000. Now it's about 10 cents. Uh, and, and rapidly on its way to, to, to closer to zero. Uh, I, I think that the figure that I saw is that, that it costs 17 cents to store all of the phone conversations made by a person for an entire year, and that'll be two cents by 2016. Um, what does that mean for us? Uh, it means that for the first time in human history, it's technologically and financially feasible to record everything we say and do, our phone conversations, our emails, our movements, uh, even security cameras and video, uh, and store that forever. Um, and, and it's important because for most of at least modern human history, our principal privacy protection didn't come from law. Uh, it came from cost. Uh, the police and, and corporations, for that matter, had to make decisions about who they were going to follow, for how long and why. Uh, if you wanted to track somebody's location, um, you needed to have teams of officers doing it. Uh, now that one officer sitting at a computer can follow hundreds of people in real time, um, we may need law where we didn't need it before. Uh, we've learned in recent months that the head of the NSA, uh, Keith Alexander, uh, has a motto which is collect it all, uh, and has said to his subordinates, let's collect it all, the authorities will follow. Uh, and and uh, we will return to that as well. So, so that's largely the government. Um, companies, of course, are doing the same thing. They're already mining your data to, to try to learn all kinds of things about you, um, sometimes things that you might not yet know yourself. Um, there, there was a much heralded article in the New York Times about the chain store Target, um, which hired teams of mathematicians uh, to find out things about their customers. It turned out that it's very valuable very, very valuable to, to earn the allegiance of people during their pregnancy because the allegiances that they make at that time will carry over. If it turns out that they can buy all kinds of simple things there, they'll, they'll return to your store. So Target wanted to know which of its customers were pregnant, and they hired some of the, the best uh, mathematics PhDs to help them sift through their data and figure that out. 
Uh, it turned out not to be an extremely difficult problem for these mathematicians. Uh, some of the products that were associated with pregnancy were unscented lotions, various kinds of vitamins, cotton balls, and Target started to send targeted advertisements uh, to these people, targeted coupons. Um, in a famous incident, the father of a teenage girl came in to Target to complain um, that his daughter was being sent these advertisements uh, and then later apologized to Target uh, because he said, apparently you knew something that I didn't. Um, and so what was Target's response to this? Their response to this was not to stop sending these advertisements to pregnant teenagers, but to try to disguise those ads uh, more carefully so that people wouldn't realize that they were aimed at them. They might put a lawnmower next to the product um, in the ad. This seems pretty harmless, right, for the most part. But you can be sure that companies like Target and many hundreds of companies that you've never heard of uh, that are data brokers also know your mental health status, your sexual orientation, uh, and lots of other very sensitive information about you. And I wonder if it makes anybody here uncomfortable that companies know and are selling to other companies the fact that you may be overweight or depressed or gay. Uh, I think people would be pretty shocked to know how much information about their lives has been collected and distributed with their consent uh, and is now in the hands of these companies, each of which is trying to turn the information into dollars uh, and also often turns it over to the government. And this, of course, is fueled by the predominant business model of the internet, which is massive data collection and aggregation. Um, if you saw Facebook's initial public offering, I wonder if anybody scratched their heads. You know, why is a company that had a billion dollars of profits valued at $100 billion by Wall Street? Uh, not only that, it's a company that we don't pay for, that is given free to all of us. I mean, there is a rule of thumb that you should keep in mind. If you are not paying for a product on the internet, you are not the customer. You are the product. Uh, there's a, there's a, a very funny cartoon of two pigs sitting in a barn, and one says to the other, you know, isn't this place great? We're not paying anything for this barn. And the other one says, yeah, even the food is free. <laughs> so the lesson here is you need to be careful what you don't pay for. Um, we are being fed to these companies' real customers who are, who are professional advertisers. And, and I want to be clear here, this is not intended to be a kind of anti-technology polemic. Um, I actually think that all of the technologies that I've discussed so far have enormous benefits. Um, we like our smartphones, not because we're dupes, but because they actually deliver very, very valuable services to us. Um, it's nice to be able to use this to figure out where the traffic is, um, to get directions to places. You know, I love having easy pass on my car so that I can go into the fast lane on the highway and not have to wait for a toll. Uh, if you think about the kind of analytics that these companies like Google are capable of doing, they can track infectious diseases sometimes even faster um, than the CDC can do that. Um, we like to shop online because sometimes we're busy and we can click on something and a nice package arrives at our house. I mean, even social networks. Could there be a more efficient way to compel me to look at my friend's baby photos? Um, no, but I would even go so far as to say something like drones. Um, you know, dr drones are mostly discussed in human rights circles as killer robots. Um, but imagine how useful drones could be if they were used to fly over places like Darfur where human rights abuses were taking place and to record them uh, and make the world see them. Um, all of these technologies are here to stay. Uh, for most of us, opting out is not going to be an option. We have to keep in mind that new technologies always have a kind of angel and devil associated with them. You know, that GPS is going to help us from, from getting lost. It's also going to help our stalker find us. Um, if we want to prevent the benefits of these new technologies uh, from being a kind of devil's bargain, we're going to need the right kinds of laws and rules that will protect our values. Uh, and here's where the bad news comes in and the real theme of this conversation, um, which is that the law has not remotely kept pace with the development and implementation of these kinds of tracking technologies. You know, on the consumer side, we're the only Western democracy that doesn't have a basic privacy law governing the kind of data that companies can collect, the type of transparency that they have to offer to consumers, uh, or how they can or cannot use the highly sensitive information that they store. Uh, and the primary statute that limits the government's access to electronic information, you know, both real-time interceptions and stored communications, 
was enacted in 1986, before there was even a World Wide Web. Uh, and this has led to all kinds of really arcane and inexplicable distinctions. For example, emails that are stored less than 180 days enjoy greater protections than emails that are stored for more than 180 days, even though most of us now store all of our emails forever because there's no reason uh, to delete them. You know, the Fourth Amendment also uh, has done a poor job keeping pace with new technologies. You know, I think for two principal doctrinal reasons, uh, and some of you who have taken criminal procedure will be very familiar with these. Uh, the first is that, that since the late 1960s, the, the dominant analytical mode in Fourth Amendment jurisprudence has been to ask the question, um, do we have a reasonable expectation of privacy? Uh, a reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, and that's how we weigh whether the Fourth Amendment uh, applies or is violated. But how are we actually supposed to know and how are courts supposed to decide whether any given expectation of privacy is reasonable or unreasonable? Uh, and especially with respect to new technologies, uh, can end up being a very circular test. Uh, our expectations of privacy depend on the amount of surveillance and incursion that we actually experience. And as new technologies make these incursions more pervasive, our expectations probably diminish. And according to this rule, as our expectations of privacy diminish, there's a corresponding diminution in constitutional protections. So what was intended to be a kind of flexible rule uh, ends up being a kind of one-way ratchet downwards. Uh, you know, the other doctrine that has, that has come under very legitimate recent criticism uh, is something called the third-party doctrine. Uh, and in a series of cases in the 1970s, which were ill-advised then and, and are absolutely silly now, uh, the Supreme Court held that when we voluntarily divulge information to any third party, we waive our constitutional protection over it. That doesn't mean that we lose all of our privacy protection. I mean, consider medical records. Uh, but under this rule, you, by going to a doctor uh, and having a doctor generate information based on what we say, the Fourth Amendment wouldn't protect that. There are statutes um, that protect that. Um, uh, but think about, again, uh, it, it, is, it is one thing for the Supreme Court to say in the 1970s that a single bank record um, doesn't enjoy constitutional protection. Um, but now we store almost our entire lives um, in a digital cloud with internet services. Uh, and, and according to this doctrine, none of that enjoys any constitutional protection. So if you have a handwritten diary that you keep at night and you keep it in your drawer, uh, the government is going to need a warrant under the Fourth Amendment to come into your house and get it. Uh, if you store that as a Google document in the cloud, uh, according to this doctrine, the Fourth Amendment has nothing to say about it. Um, most relevant to the discussion today, when you make a phone call, you lose constitutional protection over the so-called metadata of that phone call. The metadata is the information on the outside of the envelope of that phone call, not the conversation itself, but who you called, when, for how long. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, we've heard over and over again from national security officials in the last few months, including the president, don't worry, the NSA is only collecting metadata. Uh, but think about what metadata is, uh, and especially if you collect all of it over time, what it might reveal. Um, let's imagine a scenario in which a woman calls her gynecologist, then her mother, then a man she had regularly exchanged phone calls and text messages with after midnight, then a family planning clinic. I would say that a story might emerge from the metadata of those phone calls, and you might not even require the content in order to know what that story is. Uh, according to the Supreme Court and according to the, to the government in defense of these NSA programs, none of that information enjoys any constitutional protection because you voluntarily divulged it to the phone company in order to connect your phone call. So this was the state of the law in 2012 when the Supreme Court heard the case of United States versus Jones. Um, Jones was a nightclub owner in Washington, D.C. The police suspected that he was also a drug dealer. They crawled under his car, they put a GPS device on it, and they used it to track his movements over the course of about a month, uh, and Jones was convicted of being a drug conspirator. Now, when this case arrived in the Supreme Court, the government said, this is a very easy case. How could Jones have a reasonable expectation of privacy, or indeed any expectation of privacy, on the public streets? He voluntarily revealed his location, not just to law enforcement, but to everybody else by traveling in public. The police wouldn't need a warrant to follow him around in their own car. 
You know, why in the world should they need a warrant to follow him electronically? Uh, Jones, I, I think this is a very significant case uh, because it demonstrates that there is a huge difference between traditional surveillance, which, as I said before, you know, would have required teams of officers to follow him around in shifts, uh, and GPS monitoring, uh, which really would allow law enforcement to follow all of us uh, over long periods of time and analyze that data. Um, all nine justices in this case agreed that prolonged GPS tracking by the police was a search under the Fourth Amendment. Um, this may turn out to be one of the most important Supreme Court cases uh, of the last 50 years. We will see uh, uh, as, as future cases work their way up. Um, the principal opinion in Jones is written by Justice Scalia, and it's a masterpiece of his approach. Um, Scalia says that the GPS monitoring was a search, but not because of any reasonable expectation of privacy. Those words don't appear in the Constitution. Uh, but because law enforcement in this case had engaged in conduct that might have provided a ground in 1791 for a suit for trespass to chattels, it is fair to say that nobody saw that one coming. <laughs> Uh, in a concurring opinion, Justice Scalia's normal ally, Justice Alito, was pretty derisive uh, of the notion that the Fourth Amendment status of GPS tracking turns on 18th century law enforcement practices. He wrote, is it possible to imagine a case in which a constable secreted himself somewhere in a coach and remained there for a long period of time in order to monitor the movements of the coach's owners? <laughs> Justice Scalia suggests that something like this might have occurred in 1791, but this would have required either a gigantic coach, a very tiny constable, or both, not to mention a constable with incredible fortitude and patience. Um, Justice Alito agreed that the GPS tracking was a search because, as he explained it, society's expectation has been that law enforcement agents and others would not, and indeed, in the main, simply could not, secretly monitor and catalog every single movement of an individual's car for a very long period of time. That seems right to me. But keep in mind, that the vast majority of location tracking occurs not when the police crawl under a car and put a GPS device there, but when your mobile phone in your pocket or in your purse automatically communicates with a tower or satellite. Um, the law enforcement probably put a GPS device on a car a few thousand times a year. Um, we know that a few million times a year they're requesting the same, even more detailed information from phone companies. And under the third party doctrine, that information might not be entitled to any Fourth Amendment protection at all. This is a very contested issue in the lower courts right now. Uh, I think the Jones decision is a huge step in the right direction. Uh, we'll know in the next year whether it is an enormous step uh, or, a, or a smaller step. But we're going to be grappling with this issue for a long time. So this is probably the part in the presentation where if you were my mother, you would be saying, that's all very interesting. But so what? What does any of this have to do with me? I haven't done anything wrong. I don't have anything to hide. If they need to invade my privacy a little bit to catch terrorists or even to send me advertisements, should I really care? Uh, is this something that I need to care about a lot? Some of you might be saying, what privacy? Aren't we all Facebook exhibitionists by now? Isn't the problem oversharing, not privacy? Uh, or in the, in the words of Scott McNeely, the co-founder of Sun Microsystems, you already have zero privacy. Get over it. So are we so voluntarily overexposed that the surveillance state is a redundancy? Do good people, like all of us, have nothing to hide? So I, what, I want to, what I want to suggest today in the remainder of my remarks is that I think that this formulation offers the wrong answer to the wrong question. It's the wrong answer because all of us, in fact, have plenty to hide. And it's the wrong question because privacy is not fundamentally about secrecy versus disclosure. It's about context and it's about control. So what do I mean when I say that we all have plenty to hide? And we can start with some very obvious examples. I imagine that most of you don't invite strangers into the room when you're taking a shower. You probably wouldn't post your credit card statements to your Facebook pages, and I doubt that any of you will give me your email passwords at the end of this presentation. As Bruce Schneier, who is a security researcher, has put it very well, we do nothing wrong when we make love or go to the bathroom. We are not deliberately hiding anything when we seek out private places for reflection or conversation. We keep private journals, sing in the privacy of the shower, and write letters to secret lovers, and then burn them. 
Privacy is a basic human need. And I think that's exactly right. People hide all kinds of things from even their closest friends and family, that they're gay, that they're sick, that they're pregnant, that they're in love with someone else. There's a reason we call it private life. Now, I am a professional libertarian. I obviously don't think there's anything wrong with viewing pornography or buying sex toys or picking my nose, for that matter. That doesn't mean I wouldn't want to hide all of those activities from most people. Privacy is not about concealing vice or wrongdoing. Secrecy might be a better word than that. It's about the human need for refuge from the eyes of the community and from the constant monitoring that living among other people entails. It's about the need for space in which to play and try out new ideas, identities, behaviors without lasting consequences. The debate about privacy is too often presented in either or terms. Either we've chosen to keep something secret or we've decided to reveal it to the world, the third party doctrine. But so much of our lives falls in between those two extremes. This is what I meant when I used the words context and control a minute ago. People might speak very loudly on their cell phones with little regard for whether they're overheard, but we're still appalled when tabloid, tabloid reporters hack into those phones, and not just because the hacking is criminal, but because the individuals have been violated in some very serious way. So what does this mean for the future? What does the future hold? Notwithstanding what we've learned about the NSA in recent months, a future without privacy is not inevitable. There is nothing inherent in new technologies that requires us to give up privacy. We can design our society however we choose. Uh, and if we don't make that choice, that choice will be made by others. Uh, and we've seen who those others are. They are government security agencies who want as much information as possible. That's their job. That is their function. Uh, it's corporations. They want as much of our personal data as possible. That's their business. Uh, and, and those are the people who are going to drive the, the landscape of privacy if, if we don't. If there's going to be a constituency for privacy, it has to be the rest of us. Now, how are we going to build this constituency for privacy? Uh, a couple of quick anecdotes that, that might point a way. Um, when Judge Robert Bork was nominated to be Justice Robert Bork uh, in the late 1980s, uh, very controversial nomination, um, a a DC, Washington, D.C. area video store gave his rental records to a reporter for the Washington City Paper, which is a local newspaper. Uh, and the newspaper published the records of Justice Bork's video rentals. Do people know what video rentals are? <laughs> <laughs> we used to have to go to a video store, and there would be rows of VHS tapes, and then we would select one and go and take it out. So, um, so this was an attempt to try to embarrass Bork. They were probably hoping that they would find Deep Throat or, you know, or, or, or some other pornography. His video rental history was pretty unremarkable. Um, he had a day at the races, ruthless people, and the man who knew too much. Um, now, the ACLU, which opposed the Bork nomination, did object um, that the story was tantamount to breaking into his house to determine what books he read. Um, but this is an interesting story because um, 535 people who read that story got very, very nervous. They were the members of the United States Senate and the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. uh, and they probably didn't relish the idea of their video rental history being published in a newspaper. The result, the Video Privacy Protection Act. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it scared lawmakers into providing some protection. Um, w w uh, a, a few other examples. Um, there is a new technology that's really proliferating throughout the United States called automatic license plate readers. And these are cameras that can snap photos of many thousands of license plates in a minute uh, and, and record the license plates with the GPS location and aggregate it together in databases. These can provide a pretty detailed record of where we've all been. Um, Police departments are using these things really to accumulate millions or hundreds of millions of records and then to store them in databases. So far, this has been pretty unregulated. That may be about to change. We just published a big report about this. Um, a newspaper in Minnesota used freedom of information laws to obtain location data for the city's mayor for a year. Uh, and and, and uh, when, when the Minneapolis Star Tribune published this information, the mayor, who had not been interested in this at all, immediately asked the police, of, the police chief for a new policy on data retention. Right? Uh, and, and finally, from the Jones case itself, um, this is from the transcript of the oral argument. 
Chief Justice Roberts asked the government's lawyer, do you think that you know, the, government's, the government's argument, of course, was GPS tracking is not a search. So Robert says, do you think there would also not be a search if you put a GPS device on all of our cars, the justices, monitored our movements for a month? Do you think that you're entitled to do that under your theory? There was some hemming and hawing from the government lawyer. So your answer is yes. You could tomorrow decide that you put a GPS device on every one of our cars, follow us for a month, no problem under the Constitution the government's lawyer. Well, equally, Mr. Chief Justice, if the FBI wanted to, it could put a team of surveillance agents around the clock on any individual and follow that, any, that individual's movements as they went around on the public streets, and they would thereby <laughs> gather. This was the wrong answer. Uh, this was not the answer that the Supreme Court justices wanted to hear, and I think it was a critical exchange in their unanimously rejecting the government's theory. Um, in each of these scenarios, powerful government officials who were in a position to provide citizens greater privacy protections realized that they had a personal stake, uh, that they had some skin in the game, so to speak. And if you take anything away from this presentation today, uh, I hope it will be that when it comes to privacy, we all have some skin in the game. So I'm glad we have about half an hour left for questions, because I'm more interested in hearing what you're interested in, but thanks for listening. Uh, thank you, Ben. Um, so we're going to have a Q&A, so if you could identify yourself and ask your question, and we'll probably collect two or three questions at a time and then have you answer them. A lot of the surveillance seems to come, like you said, from corporations. So my name is Nick Tallam with 3L. Mm -hmm. A lot of the surveillance comes from private corporations. Um, what kind of regulations might we put in place to limit that, and would those regulations make the cost of Gmail or Facebook or, or even our cell phones too high? I mean, at some point, are we happy with being surveilled by Facebook because it's free, and I don't want to pay for a social network? Can I take that one? Yeah. Well, yeah, take the you okay. Um, two questions, Ben. Um, Larry Helfer. Um, I teach here um, and run the international law program. Um, first, is it are your um, comments specifically focused on the level of regulation in the United States? So, for example, I know, I'm sure you do too, that the European Union uh, and its member states are much more uh, restrictive of uses of personal information. So is that the model we should follow, or does that too have problems? I mean, after all, the Europeans have the same sort of um, addiction to technology that we seem to. Uh, and so have they gotten it right somehow? And, and then the second question to think about is, what about counter technologies? I was thinking about things like you know private browsing and, and, and anonymizing software and things like that. Is that all just a myth? Or are we just, in fact, giving more information to those companies that sell those kind of counter technologies? Or can they actually provide some way of capturing back privacy? That's a handful. Why don't we take those yep. and then we'll move on to, to others. Um, so I think the first question is, you know, what do we do, really, about this predominant business model? Um, is, there, is there some way that the, the economics of the internet could be restructured in a way where um, you know, we might choose to pay for some of these services in exchange for not being spied on um, by these companies? I do think that, um, that for better or for worse, um, and I would argue you know, largely for worse, um, it, it's probably too late to put that cat back in the bag. Um, you know, the Googles and the Facebooks um, are just too powerful. And, and, you know, I mean, Facebook in particular um, is, is a kind of monopoly on what it does. You can't opt out without, you know, giving up perhaps years of, of social contacts and connections um, that you've made. So what kinds of regulations are necessary? I mean, here I think that we might want to be thinking about these two massive entities, um, the Silicon Valley companies and, and their corporate spying and the national security state and its uh, intelligence spying um, as two different power centers uh, and think about what kinds of checks and balances um, might be useful. I mean, to me, the perfect storm is when, as we saw with the prison program and the NSA disclosures, um, these massive entities are working secretly hand in glove. Um, and that to give something to one of these companies is essentially akin to giving it to the NSA. Uh, but what if we thought about um, ways in which we could drive a wedge between 
the um, corporate surveillance and state surveillance. Um, what if we thought about ways that we could um, uh, push these companies to stand up for our privacy rights with respect to the government? Uh, and what if we could do a better job in pushing the government to stand up for our privacy rights with respect to these companies? I mean, some of us believe uh, that we need the government, we need regulators like the Federal Trade Commission in Washington to very aggressively protect us as consumers, uh, and that we need these technologies companies to protect us as citizens um, from the government. Uh, and I think that's where the sort of successful strategies will go, and it kind of dovetails with this question um, about Europe. Um, or, or other models of doing this, because I do think that where this change is going to come um, is, I mean, the, the, perhaps the biggest change from the Snowden revelations um, is that these massive U.S. technology companies are terrified uh, that they're going to lose their global business. You know, that's where they saw their growth. Um, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook recently um, derided the NSA for saying, you know, why do you keep standing up and saying um, that you're not uh, storing Americans' records. You know, some of us actually have businesses throughout the world, and we want to uh, protect privacy rights from from everyone. I do think that there's going to be some leverage there. Um, no, I mean we we look at this as a as a global issue in some respects, um, particularly on the consumer side, and 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 we go to Brussels and kind of participate in European lawmaking with the hope that that stronger protections there will lift all boats. Um, that, that companies like Google and Facebook won't really want to change their practices in every country, and that if, if all the countries in Europe say you have to conform to this standard to, to operate here, that that will also protect uh, American consumers. Um, I, I do think that, um, that on the state surveillance side, there are important differences um, between whether you're being surveilled by your own country or by another country. Um, I, I don't think that it's uh, a satisfactory to answer to say that, you know, we all have privacy rights and surveillance is the same thing no matter where it occurs. Um, it does matter more when it's your own sovereign. Your own sovereign is the one that can come in the middle of the night and arrest you and take you away. It doesn't mean it doesn't matter at all um, if it's someone else's sovereign. And, you know, the U.S. obviously has a, has a large footprint um, outside the United States with its watch lists and, and drone strikes and, uh, and, and others. Um, but, but I do think that that the reforms are going to have to be both international and domestic um, for, for them to work. As far as counter technology, I do think that that, that is going to be um, a very significant um, driver here of privacy protection. Um, some of the best counter technologies, some of the most sophisticated ways of communicating to make it hard for intelligence agencies to, to intercept your communications will probably remain the province of technological elites. They're just not being presented to the public as usable alternatives. Uh, most people will use the free email. Um, you know, on the other hand, when a company like Google decides to go to encryption by default for its emails, you know, by flicking a switch, all of a sudden billions of people around the world have greater privacy rights and are protected against, um, you know, bulk surveillance. Um, so I do think that, that that in that sense, pushing the big companies, not, not the fringe efforts that, that will be used by hackers and technologists, but pushing the big companies um, to put user privacy ahead of cooperation with the government um, is a hugely important area of advocacy. We have a number of hands um, at the very back, and then we'll come down here. So. <laughs> Types of information they collect. How do you perceive the law as kind of moving towards a step-by-step -step basis where diff like each time you take a different technology to court and that kind of information is said to be too private to interfere with? And then how do you how does the law eventually catch up that it can design sort of a oh uh, <laughs> it can design sort of a pan am um, law that applies to all kinds of information collected by all different technologies, predicting even future te technologies. Yeah, that's a great question. All right, we'll add one more question. Yeah. Uh, you kind of said that, you know, some of these more advanced counter-technology techniques are really just for, like you said, you know, the hackers and the technologies. But one of the things that uh, is kind of a consideration is uh, how to maintain attorney-client confidentiality in an age where everything is being recorded. So what would you suggest if you're an attorney and you're communicating with clients that you know you reasonably suspect are being watched by the NSA? How do you try and maintain that confidentiality? Yeah. I mean, let me start with that one and then move back. Um, you know, I think we all have to acknowledge that what protects us 
from that kind of NSA surveillance is their respect for the law and not our technological prowess. You know, the NSA spends $10 billion a year trying to crack encryption and to, to, to get around even the most sophisticated privacy techniques. So if the NSA really wants your conversation um, with your client uh, and they don't fear the fallout that, that might come from their interfering with a U.S. lawyer's inter interference with the U.S. client, they're going to get it. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that, that you shouldn't take steps to protect that communication from less sophisticated attackers. Um, you know, there are hacking units in the FBI and in local police departments. There's other, you know, non-state hackers. There are foreign countries that might be interested in the communication, depending on what kind of, um, uh, what, what the nature is of your case and your representation. So, um, so I do think that, that equipping those clients with encryption tools, and depending on how secret it is, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, for, for one particular case and client, I bought a new computer, uh, and I only use it for communicating with this client using a very specific kind of um, encryption and disguising technology. I don't think you can really do that for most cases, and it requires having a sophisticated client on the other end who's also capable um, of using it. I think what we really want to do um, and I think that, that more money is going into making the most sophisticated encryption more usable. Um, but I don't know if you've ever tried to use, you know, PGP. Um, it, it's, it's really difficult. It's really annoying. Um, and uh, and I, I just I don't think that's going to be the answer for our whole profession. So how do we, um, how do we make our privacy law evergreen? You know, how are we not always fighting the last fight? Uh, I think it's a really great question. Um, and, you know, I think that, that this will play out with some of the litigation that we're doing right now. You know, so we, the first case that we filed post Snowden, the very first document that was published was, a, was an order um, from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court to Verizon Business Records, um, uh, demanding that it turn over on a daily basis all of the metadata for every phone call made in the United States. And we now know that those orders went to every other phone company, too. Uh, and the NSA retains five years of all telephone metadata for all American phone calls. Well, it happens that the ACLU is a customer of Verizon Business Records. Um, and, and so we went into court um, to challenge this on behalf of ourselves, um, you know, when you think about all the kinds of people who call the ACLU uh, and who depend on, on confidentiality to do that, from people seeking help with um, immigration status to people seeking help with reproductive rights to whistleblowers, um, um, you know, our telephone metadata is just an absolutely extraordinarily sensitive, um, 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 you know, uh, trove for, for any government. And the government has defended its program on the basis of this 1970s case that I mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, where the Supreme Court said that the metadata of one phone call does not get constitutional protection. I think that if we can get a federal court, um, ideally the Supreme Court, um, to, to essentially um, to dispense with this part of the third party doctrine as it relates to aggregated metadata, um, that that would have an effect beyond a particular technology. You know, the case that we are using to, to argue that the NSA program is unconstitutional is the Jones case, which was about GPS tracking. You know, we say the reasoning is the same. You know, it's one thing to follow someone around for one day. It's another thing to have months or years of that person's location data that you can analyze. Um, it seems to me that that kind of reasoning would apply beyond a particular technology. You know, the harder question is, how does Congress do it? How does Congress not end up with another Electronic Communications Privacy Act in 1986 that is just a mockery? Um, do they have to return to these laws every couple of years? Do they need to be sunsetted um, and have um, you know, provisions in there? I mean, I can tell you Congress could use some help. Um, that there are none of the committees in Congress that deal with these issues have any staff technologists at all. So, so Congress is very much at the mercy of the, you know, many thousands of technologists who work for the companies that Congress is trying to regulate. So, so one thing that we need to do is to get more people with great tech skills. We need engineers and computer scientists um, to be working for civil society and not just working for the surveillance state and, uh, and Silicon Valley. Yep, Andrew. Perhaps how we, you've suggested that mainstream, just look at the mainstream technology companies. 
I'd like to suggest, though, that there's more, we shouldn't naturalize technology. The fact that telecommunications companies sit on big piles of data and that Google sits on big types of data, that's not because technology just is that way. We regulate technology. So isn't there another fight here, which is about regulating technology? If, for instance, we started using um, different spectrum policy, where, um, where we weren't all having to use the assigned spectrum, we'd have lots more telecommunication providers, we'd have ad hoc networks. <clears throat> the same thing goes with, let's say, Apple. If we didn't have software patents, then um, they wouldn't have that kind of power to stop us modifying the apples that everyone other than me insists on buying. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we could, we could hack the device so we wouldn't necessarily give them the information we didn't want to. So it, it, it seems to me that that's a longer fight, certainly not the only fight, but it's a necessary fight because technology just it isn't just the way it is. It's the way it is because those companies have got the regulations they want. Um, my question had to do with uh, transparency. Um, so the administration is walking a fine, li a fine line between oh, Snowden is a traitor slash fugitive and then also saying, but also we're going to review some of the stuff that he disclosed, uh, although everything's okay. You know, it, so my question is how do we find out what the government is doing in terms of national security? And there have been some proposals regarding the, um, the foreign intelligence surveillance or whatever it is, um, having an advocate go in, because a lot of the, the court proceedings are just the government lawyer saying, uh, you know, Your Honor, this is okay because of our interpretation of uh, the Patriot Act, for example. Um, and then you find out that the um, NSA director is lying before Congress or yeah. some people's interpretations. Yeah. Lying before Congress. So my question is, what, do, you, do you endorse any kind of proposals like having um, – Government lawyers go in there and, and argue on the other side of, of, of the case, um, or maybe making certain um, court orders public. And how do you decide what's public and what's not? Um, excellent comment. Excellent question. Um, the, the the comment first. Uh, I I endorse fully. We have to be really careful not to be deterministic or to sort of succumb to this inevitability. Uh, and it's actually worse than that. I mean, the technology companies are masters of pushing off uh, any kind of regulation. They, 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 have, they have pushed this buzzword innovation to the top of the normative hierarchy. And so you know, if, you, if you propose to regulate them in any way, they say, no, 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 it's too early. We're, we're, we're just beginning to build this industry and you'll, industry and you'll stifle it. Uh, but then in the same sentence, they'll say, no, 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 it's too late. If you do it, you'll break the free internet. Um, and, and they can say those in the same paragraph without any kind of sense of irony or self-awareness. Um, and, and that is a very kind of dangerous um, road to go down. Um, no, I mean, we, we, need to, we need both law and alternatives. Um, we also, we can't be naive about the power of these companies. Um, it's really hard to get telecommunications companies to do anything. Uh, you would think it would be easier with them given that we pay them. You know, unlike the internet companies who we don't pay, you know, the AT&Ts and Verizons, we actually pay them every month. Uh, but still, they're such a highly regulated industry and they're so hand in glove with the government that, that, that it, is, it is really hard to, to push them to get changes. Uh, I think that as all of these technologies get cheaper, um, you know, that will both make the surveillance issues more difficult, but also make the alternatives more scalable. Um, and we're going to start to see, um, you know, activists trying to scale up um, different communication systems, you know, that are not as locked in. And we're going to see the government furiously fighting back against that um, and demanding that states compel technology companies to build surveillance backdoors into their products, um, which is one of the great debates that we're having right now. Uh, and you see some of these companies like Lavavit shutting down rather than facilitating government surveillance requests. So, I, no, I think this is, I don't want to give the impression that, that I'm hopeless about this. I think that uh, I'm very curious about it um, to, to, see, to see what our technologists will do post-Snowden, to see what our cryptographers will do post-Snowden, you know, the ones who are horrified to see that all of their efforts have been manipulated by, by, the, by the NSA. Um, the question here is, you know, how do you, how does a democratic government deal with accountability over secret programs? Um, and and that, is a, that question is fundamental. Um, if we think that any government activity is legitimately secret, there's going to be, a, there's going to have to be a way to create 
an oversight mechanism that doesn't require the public knowing everything and then getting to deal with it through voting and elections. We're going to need to have, you know, intelligence committees in Congress, you know, that, that essentially fulfill that oversight function for us. We're going to have to have courts like the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court that, that fulfill that oversight function for us. I mean, what we've seen and what, what the Snowden revelations have really laid bare um, is that those oversight mechanisms completely failed here. Um, and they failed for reasons that we need to address. I mean, first and foremost, um, they failed because the amount of information that's classified and is subject to those top secret stamps you know, massively exceeds any legitimate government secrecy interests. So, so to me, that's like the original sin here is that um, so much that should never have been secret is secret. Uh, in terms of the structures, you know, we have, as you said, a, a, a secret court that has effectively functioned as a rubber stamp because it's one-sided. Um, it hears only from the, the government, and not just from the government, but from national security officials who, who have one interest. It's, it's, I, I don't blame them. You know, it's their job to get this information. It's not their job to make the other side's arguments. And in Congress, you have intelligence committees that are really captured. Um, and they're captured by the agencies that they're supposed to be regulating, and they're captured by the, compa captured by the companies that, that fund their campaigns that stand to gain the most from their appropriations. Um, to me, the mo one of the most extraordinary articles that has come out post-Snowden was not based on Snowden documents. It was an article in Foreign Policy magazine about General Keith Alexander of the NSA. He has hired Hollywood set designers to build his command center, uh, and they modeled it on the bridge and the Starship Enterprise. And when he goes in there with lawmakers who regulate him, the doors open whoosh, like that with the same sound and close like that. And then they get to sit in the chair while he and his aides on the big screen, you know, show all their very cool data tools uh, and, and explain, look, this helps us do X, Y, and Z. And if we didn't have this tool, you'd be harming national security. Um, the people in the intelligence communities who are the ones who should be the most skeptical uh, of what the national security state is doing are, in fact, the ones who are most captured by what the national security state is doing. So what do we do about this? You know, I, I don't know what proposals there are to reforming the intelligence committee. Um, and, and uh, you know, I mean, because for a lot of this information, their staff isn't even allowed to see it. You know, it's just a member of Congress herself or himself who goes in there. Um, I do think that reforms to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court um, are likely to happen and should be supported. Um, I, I don't think that it's a cure-all, but I do think that having someone, an advocate, in the room whose professional obligation is to present the argument on the other side will invariably have an effect, even if it just affects, um, you know, what kinds of arguments the government is willing to bring into that process. I mean, you sort of, sort of saw at Guantanamo um, a very flawed military commission system. You know, they've had military lawyers on the prosecution and military lawyers on the defense. Uh, and we all criticize these procedures as being incredibly unfair. But just by bringing professional defense lawyers into the system, people whose job it was to defend the accused, um, you know, the effect was extraordinary. Um, and you saw, you know, people, you know, coming close to being acquitted um, in these processes or getting very, very short sentences just because the government had to make its case to a neutral tribunal and there was consensus. So I do think that's valuable. You know, one of the other reforms I've been pushing um, is for, for Congress to essentially say, we have standing to challenge these programs. Um, you know, every case that we've brought against intelligence surveillance to date um, has been dismissed on secrecy abstention. Um, we, we, when we've tried to challenge the ethics practices before, they come back and say two things. You know, number one, you don't have legal standing to be in court to challenge this because you don't know whether you've been surveilled by us. Number two, whether you've been surveilled by us is state secret and state opinion. You know, ergo, no one can challenge this program in court, but don't worry, it's constitutional. Right? We promise you it's, not, it's constitutional. Um, and so, the, you know, the same government officials who loudly insist that there's nothing wrong with what they're doing, their programs are totally unconstitutional, fight tooth and nail to prevent courts from actually adjudicating that question. So we're going to need to have some who don't just tinker with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, but also more fundamentally um, create some avenue for us to bring constitutional challenges in ordinary federal courts. And I think those things would go a long way. Um, you know, I do think, and, and then sometimes what you need um, is someone who's willing to risk his life and his freedom uh, to put information into the public in a very and force members of Congress to see something that might have been available to them but that isn't. Um, now we have members of both parties who are sworn to the Democrats as opposed to saying, I had no idea this is what the government was doing with this. Um, and, 
And, you know, I think we all need to keep it in mind. Um, not, not as a bug, but as a feature to have whistleblowers who are willing to risk prison in order to keep the democracy alive. Can I have a question, then we'll take one or two more from the floor. Um, you mentioned in your presentation thinking about the potential good impact of tech, you know, um, so thinking about harnessing tech um, in human rights investigations or in advocacy and so forth. And this is an issue that we really struggle with a lot in the community working on human trafficking. Um, it's like, you know, how do we think about better harnessing tech, but at the same time protecting the privacy of victims? you know, as well. And so can you talk a bit more about how the calculations around privacy um, feature in those moments um, too? And I'll make you think about that while we open up the floor for any other yeah. questions or comments. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just one more follow-up. Um, you mentioned trying to put pressure on the big companies to not reveal as much of the government, but, you know, when we see sometimes Facebook changes privacy settings and there's a bit of a kerfuffle and they make a, apparently a change. Yeah. I don't even know if they do, you know. How, at what point will they just call our bluff? Because, I mean, at what point will Facebook, if we try to say, you know, make these changes or we'll leave your company, they're going to say, have fun with Friendster. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think that that's going to work with Facebook. I think with Facebook, we're going to need to push regulators to enforce their promises. Now, until we have a, a basic consumer privacy law, which we really don't, that, that provides a real baseline, you know, all that regulators can do, more or less, is make sure that Facebook and other companies do what they say they're going to do. Um, and it's amazing that even there, even though they write these you know, gargantuan privacy policies that no one reads, they still violate them. Um, and they still end up under consent decrees with the Federal Trade Commission and, and, and others. So I think we're going to need to, to, to push our regulators to remain aggressive and then to hope that European and other you know, states um, you know, force on them the, the kinds of normative rules, um, not just notice, but actual baselines um, that, that, that have an impact on us as well. Uh, I, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, I don't, I don't think that the, there's going to be a sort of voting with our feet with Facebook. With Facebook. With other companies, though, there has been. Um, I mean, some companies have had, you know, one little privacy scandal and have basically been knocked out, you know, earlier on in their game. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, with something like that that has a billion users, um, you can't just go to their rival unless you bring all your friends with you. Um, I, you know, so I, I, I share your view. Jane, can you be a little bit more specific about yeah, your so question? Just to give you an example, I mean, so yeah. we've been talking about, um, you know, when you take hotline data on behalf of people who've called up, um, who've you know been trafficked and, and so forth, you know, whether respecting privacy fully in that circumstance, you know, requires talking to them about what we'll use that data for and getting their consent and, and so forth, at which point, You've, there's, you know, they've hung up the phone on you and you've sort of not had, you know, the, the intended impact you want to have. And so, you know, when you talk about using drones to, you know, look at people in, in Sudan and, and, and elsewhere, I mean, there are also privacy concerns of human rights victims too. And so how do we balance our need to want to use tech to draw attention to their issue, uh, to maybe locate them, you know, in the case of people who've been trafficked um, and so forth? bearing those goals in mind whilst also protecting their privacy and their yeah. own aspirations. There's no simple answer to that mm -hmm. except to be very, very attentive mm -hmm. to it in the course of our work. Um, you know, the, w w and, and it's not a new issue for us. Mm -hmm. um, if we get documents from the Freedom of Information Act that expose what we consider to be government wrongdoing but mm -hmm. have in them um, information that we think might implicate or violate somebody's personal privacy, mm -hmm. um, what do we do? Yeah. Well, we redact. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you can say in, in, in those cases we have put mm -hmm. privacy and security over transparency. Mm -hmm. We can't pretend that all of these goals that we share are never in conflict with each other yeah. okay. um, because they are mm -hmm. sometimes in conflict with each other. Um, you know, when when the New York Times is given a trove of documents about Iraq and Afghanistan that show human rights abuses but might also uh, reveal um, people who are working undercover for the United States, what do they do? Mm -hmm. Well, they don't accede to the government's demand that they not publish anything. Mm -hmm. They do sit down with the government and have a conversation about how they might be able to minimize some of that harm, and then they make their own decision about what to publish. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the way we need to think about our work here. We need to be mindful of it. I think we, we need to give reasonable notice when we can. Mm -hmm. I don't think you answer the phone at a hotline saying, this phone call's being recorded, and da 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 I think you need mm -hmm. to, to, to give the help. I think you need to have the best practices that you can. I think that you need to have a website that has 
um, that has your values and principles laid mm -hmm. out so that someone before she makes that call mm -hmm. might have had an opportunity to, to look at that. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. none of these are perfect mm -hmm. solutions, um, but, but I think that, you know, these kinds of tensions and conflicts are not created by technology. They're not new mm -hmm. to us. We have mm -hmm. dealt with them, mm -hmm. um, you know, for as long as we've been doing this kind of work. Great. Um, okay, so a huge thank you to Ben for taking the time out of your schedule. To do this. Thank you.